It is Thursday, July 16th, 2009. My name is Ellie Gettinger, and I am visiting with Jerry Benjamin as part of, as part of the Video History Project of the Jewish Museum Milwaukee. Let's start out by finding out about you. Where are you from, Jerry? Physically, we're going to start out, right? Physically. Where am I from physically? I was born in Columbus, Ohio. My father was a medical student at the time. Uh, he was part of the physicians that had recently uh, returned from the war. Uh, and it's actually part of the medical students that were the physicians that had recently returned from the war. Uh, he had, uh, and they had uh, come to Cleveland because that's where medical school was. Uh, my mother was a social worker. Uh, they had both been students at Ohio State prior to the war. My mother actually during the war and my father had begun prior to the war. Uh, and uh, during the war, I guess during the war and after. So they met in the short time when Dad returned from the Army. And uh, actually they, they met uh, at the uh, Hillel House locally at Ohio State oh. uh, in one of those uh, uh, sort of organized get-together kinds of things. And, uh, and it sense. went from there. What did, um, where did your father serve? Uh, my dad served in uh, in Europe. Uh, he was uh, he was actually served as a as a uh, uh, communications off, uh, communications person in the uh, in the unit. He was a private uh, it, that uh, uh, they were among the fresh recruits that were thrown into the battles that uh, came right before the Battle of the Bulge, mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, he was part of um, part of a uh, of a battalion that uh, that uh, confronted the Germans. Uh, uh, and uh, one thing, well, it's not that one thing led to another, but the military strategy at that time was to take these three companies uh, and put uh, Company A outside on one one side and Company B on the other side and C in the middle. And that when the Germans would come in after C, um, and actually massacre C, they would take out A and B. So he was in the group that was to be massacred. He and his commanding officer were the only uh, two that survived the battle. Uh, he was the commanding officer with a belly wound. Uh, his name was William White, and uh, my father with a leg wound. Uh, they were taken by the Nazis to. Uh, to an aid station and later to a prison camp. Um, and uh, while it once uh, at the aid station, uh, they had to operate on uh, Commander White, and so they did a direct, uh, they did a direct transfusion, arm to arm transfusion. And uh, because my father had taken his tags off uh, because it identified him as being Jewish, um, actually uh, it. Uh, Bill White's instruction um, when they were being captured, that uh, uh, he, uh, they cross-matched the two of them, and Bill died uh, hooked up to my father's arm as a transfusion. So my middle name is William, oh. and I'm named for uh, Commander White, who died of that cross-match. Cross um, but he also kind of saved your dad's life by telling him to take off his tag. He also saved my dad's life by my uh, recognizing that uh, the H on the dog tag could be problematic. And my dad made it through the, the, the prison camp, um, uh, which was a really um, rough experience uh, and was actually protected. He was interrogated multiple times. Uh, they accused him of being Jewish. He looked pretty Jewish. Um, and uh, and he's finally told some French interrogator who was a collaborator uh, that uh, he was Jewish. But they, but the Russians who he was with uh, absolutely protected him and uh, didn't allow him to be uh, treated differently. So he really made it through until he was liberated, uh, you know, by uh, by these uh, wonderful sort of Russian guys that. Uh, watched over him. But it's not, you know, the thing I learned from my dad about some of this is that it's not all black and white. That, uh, for example, 
the kid, the Nazi who operated on my father's leg and debrided his wound, um, uh, spoke English. And when they talked to each other, he learned that uh, this Nazi physician had been trained in the States. And, uh, uh, and they became kind of friends. Uh, uh, he had done, I'm sorry, not that he had been trained in the States, but that he had wanted the, that he had wanted to stay in the States to, to go to medical school and, and wasn't able and was brought over there and uh, brought back home uh, and sort of fell into the war or was forced into the war. Uh, and uh, after the war, my dad sent him medical books uh, uh, back to Germany to this guy. Um, you know, when he would finish one book in medical school, he'd pack it up and, oh, wow. you know, the ones he didn't think he was going to need, he sent, sent off. An interesting connection. Really neat. How, how did your family end up in the U.S.? Where are they from? Um, uh, on my uh, dad's side, um, they're Belarusian. Uh, they came from um, a, my grandmother from a shtetl uh, called Streshin, which is about 20 Vyorsk uh, from, uh, from Zlobin. You know, you've probably heard of Shlobin. No, people, most people have heard, because uh, who've heard the stories of Shalom Aleichem. They've been called, uh, people have called, oh, look at that Shlob. So the Yiddish word Shlob, uh, which is uh, uh, a slob. You know. Like Shlob would be the yeah. anglicized Yiddish shlub? word. Is there a Shlob? Yeah, Shlob. Yeah, Shlob. Well, it's people, <laughs> Shalom Aleichem thought from Shlob, the, uh, this town, that was the town of the Shlobs. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, from uh, uh, a little shtetl named Streshin uh, that sat on the uh, Dnepr River uh, that was uh, uh, a town that where the majority of the population was Jewish when my grandmother was a little girl. Uh, although uh, today uh, I went back to Streshin, I met the last Jew of Streshin whose kids had moved off to Haifa, and he was literally the last Jewish person in Streshen. Most of the people in Streshen died uh, uh, in uh, December of 1941, uh, when they were rounded up by an Einsatz group, marched to Schlobben, uh, and uh, our relatives and cousins and so on with, with them uh, had to uh, dig a mass grave and then uh, most were buried in it alive, so they ended up the way that most of the Jews of Eastern Europe ended up in one way or another, I suppose. But uh, uh, this had particular, because it's, you know, everybody, you have your own little Holocaust. Everybody has their big Holocaust, you know, we all share it. Mm -hmm. But then you have your little Holocaust. This was our little family Holocaust. Uh, 1,143 people from died Streshen. from Streshen died in, on that day. And uh, it was virtually all of the Jews of Streshen, minus a few that had gone into the woods and became sort of part of the underground, a part of the also Russian army. Uh, they escaped uh, that fate. When I returned, actually I returned uh, to find our family homes, and uh, my first visit was in 1991. 90, uh, and uh, uh, I walked, uh, I decided to walk the same uh, hike in the winter, because it was winter about the time when this happened, and see what it must have been like to walk through these woods to the middle of this kahal, a collective farm, you know, and experience it for myself, uh, which very lonely. So it was a 20 mile walk? Or 20 viewers, uh, that's from Schlubben to, you know, it, it was about uh, 11, kilometers from where they had been kept. They first were taken to um, Zlobin, mm -hmm. uh, where they stayed in a, in a kind of a human chicken coop for a period of days, um, and then were marched to this uh, collective farm where they're a big, where they dug this ditch. Uh, so that I think was about 11 kilometers the walk. But it was interesting because walking on cold farm soil uh, frozen, a little bit of snow, you know, it's a, 
Uh, it's a long, it's a much longer walk than walking on a path, on a road, on you know through the woods. You know, a pleasant. We're used to sort of pleasant walks. You know, mm -hmm. for recreation. This had its own unique sort of quality to it, and um, so uh, that they, they uh, it, you know, you, when I went there, I, it's interesting what what the takeaway is when you're when you're all these years removed from something, and you sort of confront individual history. Uh, it was not so much the Holocaust that was the takeaway for me, or the or the end of the. It was really the. It was really, you know, what was sort of the regular life like of poor people living in this village. Uh, when I walked through the village, and I was so amazed that I was able to tell from my grandmother's stories how, uh, how I could walk around this little shtetl and know where everything was. You know, so for instance, finding my, I was there with my brother and my father on one trip. Uh, and uh, there was a man that uh, had a parachod, um, which is the kind of a boat that you pull across the water on ropes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, at least in Russian, it's called a parachod. And what do we call it in English? I don't even know what the. Uh, it's, a, it's a boat on ropes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, and he was called one armed Yussel, because he had one arm. Uh, <laughs> so. So anyway, and there was one arm Yossel's house, and there was the parachut exactly as my grandmother had described it. Just there, you know, washed up, kind of falling apart, uh, you know, grayed wood, but there it was exactly where it was supposed to be. And when I walked down this little lane along the river, my grandmother's house had fallen down where she had lived. Uh, and there was nothing where the house should have been, but her apple trees were there uh, that we knew about, and uh, they were just as she had explained them, planted so many in a row, so many down, you know, and it was it was uh, it was uh, just extraordinary the, the the fact that it was all where it was supposed to be, and we uh, snuck back with little we took little bombs of. You know, little cuttings from the uh, yeah, from true. the tree, and um, uh, it and uh, snuck it through customs and couldn't get it to grow in the state. So it, <laughs> I've always wanted to go back and steal more, uh, <laughs> but uh, so the connection, the connection to the I think the for me, so the I was saying the takeaway was the was the getting a sense of this coherent sort of Jewish life and seeing it and connecting it to my grandmother's stories. The, uh, for me, the, the reality was, was that my grandmother was a shtetl woman. She lived in our, we lived in her home, later she lived in our home. I grew up in a house uh, where my father and my grandmother spoke Yiddish to each other. My grandfather passed away when I was only six, so I didn't, on my father's side, so I really didn't know him. Uh, but it was a wonderful, it was filled with Yiddish music. I still speak Yiddish, I sing in Yiddish, you know, I love it, you know, it's a, uh, I particularly love a good joke in Yiddish, um, and uh, uh, it's earthiness and bodiness uh, and innocence uh, uh, and sometimes uh, remarkable sophistication, but usually it's more of the innocence that, that's so attractive. Uh, uh, that. Uh, and we've all gone on to our um, secular, intellectual, and business lives and things like that. Uh, and, you know, our, somehow our feet are planted in that same soil, but we're so different. Uh, our expectations are so different. And I, I, I still, you know, find a lot of the things that my grandmother would talk about, would sing about, would explain to be very consequential in adult decision making of different kinds. So in terms of you grew up with multiple generations and in your in your household, can you kind of describe how Jewish permeated? Well, be before we get to that, oh. I, I, I wanted, I wanted to go back to my mother's side. Sorry. My, mother, uh, my mother's 
story is quite extraordinary um, uh, because it, hers represents a very interesting small piece of um, American, sort of uh, both American, Jewish and American, um, just the, her own little corner of American history. My mother was the uh, eighth child of uh, Yitzchak and uh, Bessie Tannenbaum. Uh, I'm sorry, my mother was the seventh child of Yitzchak and Bessie Tannenbaum. They had eight children. They, Bessie was pregnant with an eighth huh. and had a septic abortion and died. This was 1920. Twenty-five, in Cleveland, Ohio. That, uh, that sort of when I think about what everybody has their political roots somewhere, um, and part of my political roots certainly uh, come from uh, come from learning and having known, having understood that it's possible, um, you know, to kill a woman with an abortion. As I missed a grandmother because of a septic abortion, so I, I'm I'm generous in my feelings towards people that are that are uh, so-called pro-life, but uh, but I know that I'm forcing myself for my absolute best part of me to be generous to them because I look at them, you know, and I, I you know and I see my grandmother's blood, um, you know the the people that oppose abortion. It's very rough. I mean, it's a, it's remained a rough image my entire life. Now, uh, the, it happened that my mother's uh, brothers and sisters are among the most remarkable people um, that uh, uh, that I ever had the opportunity to know. I grew up with extraordinary aunts and uncles. She was raised by her uh, first by her father until she was then uh, when. Con at one point they were going to put her in an orphanage and they didn't and she went and sort of got handed from aunt to aunt. Uh, her siblings went to the Orthodox Orphan Home in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, my mom ended up with her uh, aunt uh, Dinah uh, Kastner, uh, who became my grandparents ultimately, Sam and Dinah Kastner, the only grandparents I knew. Her father passed away when she was 16, a very poor man, a painter, couldn't die from tuberculosis, um, obviously a poor family. Uh, the, the, uh, my aunts and uncles, though, merit, uh, merit some discussion. My mother, as I said, had amazing family members. Just, just a few examples. Um, uh, Uncle Maury. Uncle Maury uh, was uh, uh, a self-taught mathematician. Mm -hmm didn't graduate high school. Uh, was so accomplished that um, Fermi, uh, uh, the physicist, uh, used Maury uh, as his calculator. He called him my little calculator. <laughs> and he worked on the Manhattan Project with Fermi, wow. uh, responsible for huge portions of the mathematics and of calculations. Uh, he taught me as a young boy uh, how to do I call them mathematical parlor tricks, but um, uh, how to simultaneously integrate and differentiate, which is sounds crazy, but you can do it and without paper. Um, and he was, you can do it. <laughs> well, no, I mean he taught me step by step. How do you do it? And what it you know, but it was before it was before I had learned trigonometry. So getting calculus out of order is very weird. I mm -hmm. mean, it's a you sort of need to know what a tangent is, you know, you need to, you need to have some idea, you know, uh, but he was, so he was wonderful in that way. Never successful as a business person, was a printer for a while, uh, did various things, but a very curious character, um, continuously studying and reading, a devout secular person who studied Torah on a regular basis, um, uh, that uh, was comfortable in uh, in Hebrew, uh, spoke beautiful Yiddish, uh, uh, was fascinated by customs, culture, and belief. Um, and just an amazing character. Married to uh, uh, my Aunt Jane, uh, who was, uh, she was um, uh, a 
a Mormon um, and, uh, uh, and a botanist and uh, also an extraordinary woman. They had a wonderful just love affair that was just spectacular. Uh, and uh, uh, when Jane was so oh, in her 60s, she had a stroke. Um, and uh, uh, and Maury wanted her to be able to uh, continue to experience motion even though she was stuck in a wheelchair and couldn't move and was really uh, pretty much had a functioning head and no functioning body. Um, so he hooked up these amazing pulley systems and weights in a huge warehouse and he would pull down on the ropes and Jane would go swinging across this gigantic warehouse flying in the air, laughing, screaming, giggling, <laughs> you know, I mean, and uh, up and down and, you know, <laughs> this huge amusement park ride on harnesses. Um, uh, and uh, it was just sort of Maury. Uh, my other uh, uh, aunts and uncles, uh, uh, my aunt Skippy, who's 90 years old uh, today, not today, but uh, recently turned 90, um, uh, was married to Another kid from the orphanage, uh, Will Herman, a writer who uh, wrote wonderful stories and murder mysteries and crime stories and was a novelist and short story writer. Uh, but uh, Skippy, uh, in her own right, uh, she was always uh, sort of the glue that held people together, always checking and working with people and making sure everything was, was sort of organized. She, uh, but she came. They, they were so, uh, I don't know, innocent, I guess you would say, would, would sum up uh, uh, where they came from. Uh, even though that they were all working and they all had uh, jobs and they were all doing interesting things, as younger people, they, they, uh, they, there was a kind of innocence and naivete that infused all of this that became the many accomplishments. And uh, the, in her case, you know, sort of, my favorite story was that when she was first getting, when she was getting married to Will at 17, she went to the doctor for her very first physical. She'd never had a physical. And the doctor saw her and told her to bring a urine specimen with her. So not knowing what that meant, she came in with a peck basket and uh, a series of quart jars of, uh, that, she, uh, that she had collected, mason jars that she'd collected since uh, hearing that she had to bring a specimen from her. <laughs> and that was really, I mean, that was, a, you know, it sort of summed up, you know, many other uh, sort of experiences. Uh, I had Uncle Leonard in the scrap business that was a very early proponent of, uh, very, he was extremely opposed to uh, segregation of all kind, would, uh, had a black partner, went down to, uh, the South, where they would pick up stuff that was going to go to their junkyard, uh, would try to rent hotel rooms uh, together. Uh, would uh, the, the white hotel owners would refuse to rent to uh, Matt, the the other the guy that he was in business with, uh, and uh, Leonard would uh, you know would would end up smacking the guy around and. You know, I mean, you know, just you know, it's getting really, you know, it was, but it was wonderful. You know, it was, uh, you know, he didn't, I don't think he hurt anybody too badly, but, uh, but uh, he was championing, championing ideas that, that uh, were very unpopular at the time. This is in the uh, 1930s and 40s? In the late 30s, early 40s. And your mom went to college, clearly. My mom went to college. She was the only one in her family of all those siblings who went to college. Did the other kids like scrimp or put aside because they were like, okay, we're going to make sure that... No, because she was being raised by her aunt and, ah. and he, he wasn't, the, my grandfather was prosperous, who was right. then her uncle, later my grandfather. Um, uh, it's just that uh, his kids were going to college, she was going to college and his kids went to college. Um, and she was one of the kids. She and she was one of the kids who obviously benefited from that. But they were they were a, they were reform Jews. They were the first reform Jews I ever met. I didn't really know what a reform Jew was. My uh, uh, your own and, family was orthodox. No, they, we were kind of uh, we were conservative. My grandmother was orthodox. We went to an orthodox shul. I studied with orthodox rabbis. You know all that kind of stuff. But but we were we were uh, sort of a 
too modern to be orthodox. Close to denominational before it was popular. No, I, we weren't post denominational <laughs> either. I don't think that would. Uh, I today am uh, certainly post denominational, but uh, then uh, no, I I just think that you know the orthodox shul uh, Agudasach in the Canton, Ohio, was really an old fashioned orthodox shul. You walked in, you were hit with the smell of uh, shiffer robes and uh, and uh, cedar chest, uh, you know, and schnapps and. Um, urine and uh, all of these things that make up sort of the smell of old people. It's sort of the, the, the fluvia of aging. And it's right there um, for you to, you know, and as a kid, you know, you really you remember the intensity of, of sort of that. You know, and, and uh, you know, the, you look at the, I, when I think back at the, at the parochet of the, uh, covering the ark at the synagogue and the lions were, uh, with their, uh, gold embroidered thread sort of springing loose. You know, they, they always look to me like they've been electrified, you know, or, or that they've run into some kind of a, of a, of a small disaster that, uh, that where they had to fight those lions and they were all like, you know, half undone. Uh, but, uh, you know, hard wooden pews, uh, um, a, uh, an old fashioned, uh, an old-fashioned chazan that wasn't that uh, that wouldn't have understood or even recognized uh, congregational life today. Mm -hmm. um, a shamus of the first order, a Holocaust survivor who scared the heck out of all of us kids. He had his coffin in the basement, and we had to sneak down to see he built his little coffin. And, and there, in the Magen David, in the middle, he had carved his numbers. It was a haunting just a haunting uh, um, memory. But a wonderful man too, but uh, wearing uh, a dark suit with threadbare and, you know, always holes and patches and, you know, with uh, uh, over his uh, long underwear, he always wore a union suit, got his, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, with his tzitzis uh, instead of a shirt, um, you know, he was, he was, you know, from another time. Right. And uh, in, in any other situation, uh, he, would have, he would have been on the street, uh, probably a street person of some kind. I don't know. I, uh, here he was. Taking uh, care of. And one of the most honored people would get uh, the, you know, would get the third aliyah, uh, said a beautiful haftar, extraordinary. Uh, with a clear voice, I thought sometimes better than Chazan Rakoff, who was a who was a, who was a good Chazan. Uh, my Hebrew teacher uh, was a man. I didn't go to the new sort of modern Hebrew school run by Mr. Goodstein. Uh, I went to individual lessons with Harab Memshin Kranis, Canton, Ohio, who had taught my father, now taught me at that age. Uh, you know. Sat in a in a in a little room with an oil cloth uh, over a small table uh, with uh, Rabbi Krinus uh, chain smoking uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, sort of having to confront the text till the point of memorization. Um, Ashkenazi Hebrew, though, right? Ashkenazi Hebrew, yeah. Uh, you know that. Uh, how many people who don't uh, who don't daven every day? I'm not uh, an everyday davener, uh, but uh, do you know that uh, that uh, know the words of the Brich Shmei by heart? Um, do you know anybody? I, Have you ever met anybody? I never met a rabbi who knew the words of the Brich. Probably a rabbi who knew the prayer. I don't know. <laughs> this weird Aramaic, prayer, weird uh, sort of Aramaic prayer. I mean, how? It, I mean, you know. Those were the things that you were looking yes. at. Yes. Yeah, and taught and expected to, expected to know and to and to and to not uh, not make a mistake. And when a mistake was made, <laughs> with a ruler on the hand, <laughs> look in the book, you know, and uh, um, and uh, he he was wonderful. But quite remarkably, he taught women as well, hmm. girls. Uh, there was he had girl students, and I. 
I didn't know how in interesting that was until years later. I, I just assumed it was sort of natural, mm -hmm. but uh, compared to virtually any other place, our treats were that we got to learn another sugi of Gomorrah, or we, uh, <laughs> we, you know, he would explain a mission to us, or we could she ask. She understand it child psychology. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or we could ask questions. We would, sometimes we would like to. Uh, we would ask him questions because we would, you know, embarrass him. We would, you know, we would ask him a question, you know, for Kadushin about uh, marital life or something like that, and and he would hit us and he'd yell mm -hmm. at us and chase us out of the <laughs> out of the house, and <laughs> say, "Come back in ten years," you know. And it was very, uh, you know, there was a lot of romance to to learning with him and. And uh, and it was a very good early education. My my uh, even though I can't keep up with a kid from yeshiva by any stretch of the imagination, my early uh, my early uh, Jewish education is still pretty good. I mean, from a I mean, I can read Rashi and mm. and I can read you know take a look at the, look at texts, work my way around them. How did you, and just so we can, because I, I, we have to get to the community here as well, H how did you meet your wife? I always knew my wife. Uh, she would say that's not true, but um, we we went to Sheratora Synagogue. Um, in Canton. In Canton, Ohio. And uh, uh, Canton's a teeny community. There's, were you high school sweeper? We were, there were 3,000 of us. Uh, I, my first, uh, I forget what, there's a wonderful word in, in, in Greek, uh, in Italian rather, that's a, a lightning bolt to the heart. Uh, you know, it's sort of that instant chemistry. I, I remember when I was, uh, we were on a U.S.-wide retreat, my parents were the advisors of the United States Youth. Sound familiar, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, 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 and we were out on this retreat, my parents liked to camp, so we were all camping. And she was in the tent with uh, Debbie Jacobs and uh, her first cousin, Laura Perlman, so Cindy Perlman then. Uh, uh, and uh, wearing a red gingham check nightgown. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, I remember it, uh, that would make us about 13 and 12 or something like that. So I have a very strong memory of uh, talking to her that evening. Um, I don't remember Debbie and Laura at all, other than the fact that they were physically there. <laughs> and that since that time I have been obsessed. <laughs> I haven't been able to shake her loose, get her out of my mind ever. Uh, and uh, I knew her before that because you just, in the congregation, you know, you know each other, but never thought of her in any kind of romantic way or never felt that zing. But, <laughs> You know, I, that you inspired uh, a tree. That, was that moment, you know, that was the moment in time, uh, you know, when it all began for me. And, uh, you know, it wasn't continuous. I mean, it took a while till it settled into a relationship. And, uh, um, and uh, we didn't really become an exclusive, even though I think uh, we were in love with each other before. I went to Israel when I was 18, kind of dodge draft, draft dodging. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I went, uh, uh, I, I was opposed to the war in Vietnam very strongly, had been marching, had been fighting, had been doing everything I could to, to oppose the war. I thought that we had made a horrible mistake and I felt that I was being sucked up into this war against my will and I looked for ways to postpone hoping that somebody would come to their sense, sense, senses and get us out of this ridiculous, unholy cause. Um, and uh, so I uh, uh, found out you could have what was called then a 4D deferment, which was the divin divinity deferment. Yeah. Um, but I didn't want to go to rabbinical school, so instead <laughs> I went to Israel as preparation for rabbinical school, managed to talk the draft board into giving me my 4D deferment but during that time, they ended the deferment process um, and went to a straight numbering lottery. Mm -hmm. And uh, so 
in the second lottery. I was living in Israel at the time. I was at Tel Aviv University when they drew the second lottery, and I was number one in the second lottery. Uh, so my birthday, July 9, 1951, I was pulled as, you know, and I go, I won the lottery, great. <laughs> so I thought I, I had uh, at that moment made Aliyah. Um, and I, uh, you know, and I was mostly concerned with how was I going to get Cindy to join me there? She doesn't know Israel, you know, and this is going to be a huge leap for her. Because that year of absence making the heart grow fonder, I was, uh, I was uh, convinced of, I wasn't convinced of a lot of things, I guess, at that time in my life. But the one thing I was absolutely convinced of was that I couldn't live without her. Um, and so that became a huge, you know, and in my stupid sort of young mind, you know, well, I have to go to war to be able to be with Cindy, or will Cindy come to Israel, you know? Uh, There's no middle ground there. You know, the, the, right, and I knew that I'd be fighting wars in Israel, and you know, I mean, you sort of knew, you saw your future, you know, mm -hmm. and it seemed like every direction pointed to a story with a gun, and having had, uh, my growing up with my father's war stories, I just didn't want to do that, but I certainly didn't want to do it in the United States. And well, anyway, to make a long story short, I had a motorcycle accident, smashed up my shoulder, was unconscious for a few days, um, and ended up with a 4F, you know, deferment, mm -hmm. which is the deferment that says that you're physically incapable of uh, being a soldier. Now, uh, I guess it's true, you know. It's uh, but uh, my shoulder. Um, never was much of a problem. A little arthritis, nothing more. Uh, I just think I had very good fortune in the draft board choosing not to want me to uh, become a soldier. How did you guys end up in Milwaukee? Well, uh, the question is how did we end up? Uh, we were first in Cleveland where we were, where we were students together. Um, her father was uh, very ill, uh, and uh, uh, we uh, he, he had uh, a tumor, and we wanted him. We wanted our parents to hold our chuppah, so we decided to get married while he was able to do that. So we did get married uh, December 30th of uh, 1973 uh, with our parents on each corner of the chuppah, but had to be seated in chairs at that point. Uh, the uh, uh, so we lived in we lived in Cleveland. I had spent some time in New York uh, while a student at Case Western Reserve University. I took courses at Columbia and was then the chair of the North American Jewish Students Network, which was a large umbrella organization of student groups, uh, uh, many of which in those days were were sort of left of center groups mm -hmm. of one kind or another. Um, that the Chavra movement didn't exist yet, um, so it was before that. Uh, it was just beginning to happen. There wasn't really, I mean, so it wasn't really a religious or spiritual sort of gathering of, of groups. It was really a, uh, it was really political, uh, concerned about Soviet Jewry, concerned about Zionism. Uh, I spent a lot of time over a few years debating Palestinians. Uh, we used to sort of go from campus to campus. Uh, one of them... Uh, so the advocacy you, you the, as the chair of this organization was so mostly Israel-based. In my case, it was a left Zionist. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I mean, I, I was trying to remember and trying to find some reference to it to, to refresh my memory. Uh, uh, last year but then found nothing. Um, uh, I think that uh, young uh, Mahmoud Abbas was one of the guys I used to debate. I thought that he was one of the... Wow. And I've been meaning to ask him when, uh, on a trip to Israel if he was... If, uh, but I, I, I can't remember. I, uh, some other people that became politically mm -hmm. uh, important were part of that circuit, but, uh, but he... Uh, I, I remember... I think I remember him, but, I, but it's a foggy memory, so it's hard to... But it was interesting. I mean, you know, it was, a, and the issues were very different than they are today. But so that was a that was an interesting period of time. Then I came back to Cleveland and uh, finished up school with Cindy, and uh, 
and we moved down to Boston, uh, where I went to graduate school. I was uh, at Harvard, and she was she continued her work as an artist. Uh, she's an artist, uh, and uh, uh, painted uh, began making Ketubot actually in around 1971, which uh, is the very beginning. Uh, she's close friends with David Moss, and uh, and uh, I've heard the two of them sort of try to date when the first, uh, the earliest of the, the Ketubot um, uh, within this new sort of uh, attempt uh, towards uh, Chidur Mitzvah, the, the decoration of religious objects began. And probably, right, she was, I guess, really right at the very, very beginning. Um, and she continued, uh, she continued to do that. It was a transportable career. Mm -hmm. She was able to put me through graduate school, um, and uh, it was during uh, during graduate school that a lot of things happened to us, um, uh, and uh, the uh, among them were having our first kid, uh, Ariel, um, and uh, and also. Uh, Founding of an organization called the Coalition, and then then it was called Coalition for Alternatives in Jewish Education, CAGE. Uh, and it was the founding of CAGE. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, uh, now Rabbi uh, Sherry Kohler Fox, um, and I uh, spent a lot of time in Cleveland, and she had been, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, she had broken leg or something and was healing, uh, I think it may have been a broken femur, it was a big break, um, and was uh, uh, and was not able to be at the university and was home in Akron, Ohio. Uh, I hadn't known her growing up, but we sort of grew up in parallel mm -hmm. uh, rows somehow. <laughs> and uh, uh, I met... Uh, Marilyn Kohler Fox. I met Sherry, um, I don't remember, but uh, uh, we were both, uh, oh, I remember, I was, I, okay, let me, um, uh, when I was, uh, when I chaired Network, one of the things that I wanted to have happen was uh, I saw the need for the sort of a gathering of Jewish educators, mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't quite sure who they should be, how they should be, and just I saw that lots of younger people that were just out of university or still in university uh, that were sort of the age of the network community at that time uh, were involved in Jewish education. So the person who followed me as uh, chair, uh, Schiffer Bronsnick, uh, took on the uh, job of, uh, of helping to create this first conference, uh, Jewish education conference. It wasn't called CAGE at that time, it was just a, a conference. Um, and. Uh, and she asked me to work on it, uh, or I asked her if I could work on it, and uh, and so I took that job on to do. And had heard that Sherry had been teaching uh, at the time, and because of that, uh, she had been doing very innovative work uh, with teacher centers, um, creating some of the earliest Jewish teacher centers and learning centers. So I said, "Oh, I got to meet this person." And there, uh, in our on the table of our teeny apartment, and. In Hessler Court in Cleveland, Ohio, we sat down and mapped out what the conference structure would look like and how we would do this. And, and uh, she was then married uh, and still is to, or was dating at the time, I guess, not married to uh, Everett Fox, who was a uh, wonderful Bible scholar, but was um, very much involved uh, through his own teachers. Um, in sort of the history and tradition of the Buber Rosenzweig Lairhouse. Um, and uh, consequently, uh, we ended up with uh, the idea of sort of uh, Lairhouse as, a, uh, as, as one significant building block of these conferences. The idea being in the German Lairhouse, people that had something to teach would sort of bring it to the marketplace of people who had something to learn. And one and one hour you'd be a teacher, and the next hour you'd be a student, and people would share, uh, would uh, would share, sort of 
what they knew with each other in kind of a kind of a democratic and interesting interesting way. And uh, to that we added, uh, I had been interested in um, uh, um, in uh, literature. No, no, I had no, no, no. I'd been uh, I'd been interested at the time in in what was um, uh, I'm forgetting the exact term of it, but the uh, sort of concentration learning where you where you uh, where you work for four to six hours in a course um, as opposed to meeting one day a week. Mm -hmm. And I had tried uh, I had tried to structure some learning environments around a long period of time uh, of classes that really allowed sort of begin, middle, and end of subject material to be developed in, uh, in, a, in, in a one session class, kind of, a, a, kind of a intensive learning experience. And we called those modules. So together we put the Lairhouse, the modules together, we created the early cage conferences, and, um, uh, and, uh, and then Sherry and I became, uh, uh, after that, uh, we became uh, friends and we were both in the same program at Harvard. Um, uh, so, actually, uh, I set the clock incorrectly when I just spoke. Uh, we, although we founded CAGE while we were at Harvard, um, we began organizing our first education conference while I was still an undergraduate in Cleveland and had met there and later went on to become classmates um, at Harvard. So how did you get to Milwaukee? So, uh, I have to get you to the city. <laughs> right. Uh, most, you know, it's interesting. Most of the uh, interesting, mo not interesting, but most of so much happened in my life prior to getting here that Milwaukee was kind of like a vacation. <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, that uh, I was founded in founded Cage. Uh, uh, had a, a very exciting first conference at Brown. Mm -hmm. um, that was uh, while I was still at Harvard. Uh, we funded it ourselves. It was our first, you know, with, with help from others, but we, Cindy and I were, we, we figured out we earned between my, between her two both, which was our primary income, and uh, what little I got as a graduate student, um, you know, teaching as a, mm -hmm. teaching sections as a doctoral student. Uh, we uh, we ended up with we had eighteen thousand dollars in one year. Uh, and you were able to fund a conference. And we and four thousand of that, five thousand of that, went to the first Cage conference. Um, that is much more than tithing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, not you know, master. I don't know. It, but um, it, no, it wasn't. Uh, never, never thought of it like that. But I mean, you know, it was really a, you know, and then plus it was all sort of a hand operation. I mean, that uh, Cindy uh, designed the conference book and the and the first poster, which, you know, people have it as a true collector's item, and it's an extraordinary picture of a little girl uh, in a photograph. Uh, she took one of Bill, Aaron, Bill Aaron's photographs of a little girl in a Hebrew school standing on her hands upside down, you know, and it announced this first conference. I mean, it was really a beautiful, beautiful uh, poster. Um, and um, uh, that uh, uh, through that, there was a guy selling books uh, named Bruce Arbett, who was a book salesperson. And, uh, uh, and he seemed, uh, although at the time, uh, he just, he was kind of, uh, he was very just involved in uh, trying to sell the books that he was, he was had a little Jewish book business. Um, but uh, he looked like uh, he knew, I mean, he, he, seemed, he seemed to like the business side of things. Uh, so we, uh, we tapped Bruce to be, uh, when I was chairing Cage, I tapped him to be my treasurer uh, and got to know him. And he started putting a uh, sales push, said, oh, come out to, uh, you know, you don't, 
don't, you're not happy as an academic. You're not going to want to be in a come to Milwaukee. We'll do this together. We'll do that together. And uh, uh, and we're out of time. We still have five minutes. Oh, we still have five minutes. Well, anyway, come to Milwaukee. We'll do this together. We'll do that together. Um, and uh, uh, I uh, I thought about it. Uh, I wasn't really sure if that was the right direction for me. I didn't. I love the East Coast, and I just couldn't imagine living living in Milwaukee, having grown up in Canton, Ohio. And Cindy was absolutely livid and just not ready to leave the East Coast. Literally, once we did make the decision to move out to Milwaukee, I had to, I had to uh, practically find and gag her and throw mm -hmm. her in the car and force her to come out here. Um, but. Uh, Bruce had made the promise that said, oh, you know, after three years, if we uh, don't really, you know, succeed or for any reason, you want to move the business to the East Coast, I'll come with you, which was a complete bald-faced lie. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, but that's another story, and here I am all these years later. So. And out of time. No, so I want to get to your organizational involvement on some, if, I don't know, we don't have much time, but. You're about to come in as the incoming president of the Federation. Well, I mean, to talk about it coherently, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you have to, um, first of all, um, I'm going to be out of time. I have a 10 o'clock appointment okay. um, where I'm going to, and, uh, and I would like to talk about it coherently um, because there's an awful lot that actually did happen in Milwaukee. Uh, so I, well, I, didn't make good, next year. I didn't make good use of my time, did I? Oh, no, you didn't. You didn't. There's so much to talk about. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry. So yeah, like, let it run for a second. Yeah. So can we make notes for next year? Yeah. Okay. Will we'll say we're going to start with Milwaukee. And say we're going to start with Milwaukee, but the things, some of the things um, that are uh, that I think are interesting about Milwaukee, and we want to just, I just want to make sure that I don't forget next year. Um, uh, one is about raising Jewish children in Milwaukee. Um, and uh, another, another is uh, uh, about, about Kaddish in Milwaukee. And a third is about the Federation as a, as a community building social network and an evolving idea and questions is, you know, I think we'll know better whether it's a survivable idea or not next year. Um, uh, that, uh, um, and uh, I also want, uh, what's, what's been interesting to me has been um, sort of the openness of people in Milwaukee to just sort of It, lack of, despite enormous class distinctions and all the stuff that's, that's here, total lack of class distinction <laughs> when it comes to the pursuit of a good cause and working you know, collaboratively mm -hmm. and shoulder to shoulder. They, look, they may not want their daughters to marry my sons, but, uh, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary. And I, I, that's so unusual, and very few of my friends uh, have experienced a similar experience. So. We do need to leave the room, but we'll talk. Yeah. Because